Okay. Of course, there's uh, always too much material, so we'll just go as far as we can. Um, so this is part two of uh, human paleogenetics, uh, but I want to start with what I think was a terrific study that just came out, um, a, an enduring uh, interest of mine is the fact that uh, at the academy we have uh, the skull of Sahelanthropus uh, uh, cadensis, um, and the big controversy since it was originally found in the early 2000s was whether it was a Miocene ape, a hominoid, uh, or a hominin. Our labeling says it's bipedal and therefore a hominin. But there's been uh, long-term controversy, basically, about it. Um, it's a remarkable skull. It's got the largest brow ridge of any um, uh, ape ever discovered. It's dated to 7 million years ago, found in Chad in the current desert, which was a, a rainforest in his time. Um, uh, and... Uh, Part of the reason for thinking he is uh, a hominin and bipedal was that his form and magnum, the hole in the spinal cord, um, uh, was, uh, they think, in the right position. When I look at it, it's very hard to tell. Um, and this is the team um, uh, that discovered it. The main researcher is not in there, but note that um, this initial photograph of the find, here's the skull. But note that there's no femur, no leg bone in this collection right here. And there's, an, uh, there's been a 20-year mystery, um, ongoing controversy about the leg bone, okay? Um, and uh, in this picture, uh, there's the leg bone. Uh, unfortunately, of course, there's no joints on either end, which makes it intensely difficult to identify than whether it was bipedal or not. Um, and there was a question about whether camel herders had reburied uh, this, these fossils facing Mecca, another interesting little tidbit. Um, and just in the last two years, there have been two contradictory looks at the femur. Uh, the first one in 2020, concluding that uh, uh, Salanthropus was an upright uh, walker. And then last year, another paper came to the opposite conclusion, basically, uh, that uh, uh, they did uh, walk on two feet and were bipedal. The new study concludes that Salanthropus was a knuckle walker, okay? which means that he was a hominid, not a hominin, not in our um, human line, basically. Um, and they did a very careful look using dozens upon dozens of uh, comparison. And it was basically based on the fact that uh, the ulna, which is one of the two bones in your lower arm, uh, is normally a straight bone. Uh, but was not uh, in Sahelanthropus. Uh, and the curve that accrues to his bone, they believe was uh, a result of his knuckle walking uh, behavior. This is uh, the bone itself and the curve uh, that typically isn't there unless you're pushing against it on a routine basis. Um, and they, um, they accepted the two potential theories, one that um, uh, Salanthropus is the earliest known knuckle-walking African ape and was not a hominin, or that if the species was capable of walking, uh, like chimps and gorillas, it was, a, in fact, a habitual knuckle-walker, despite being able to occasionally walk. Um, so uh, they did. they included 20... 
uh, sapiens, uh, a bunch of uh, 30 different uh, types of apes, uh, two myosin apes, 17 fossils, including all the ones up on our wall, et cetera, and basically ended up concluding that uh, not bipedal knuckle walking. Okay, so um, <clears throat> from my perspective, you can now take the um, let's say Helanthropus skull that we have in, in the um, closet and uh, basically tell people, well, here is uh, say Helanthropus, 7 million years old, and in, just recently he was demoted from being a hominin to a hominid. Okay, so that's the current conclusion there for uh, that group. Um, a comment about <clears throat> the terms that we use, um, like primitive, archaic versus modern, and uh, a better phrasing would be basal for the more ancestral group and derived for the more uh, recent uh, change. So, because it implies that evolution has no direction, and many of these uh, other features imply directionality, primitive, uh, modern, etc. And by the way, in all of my talks, including this one, when I use the word uh, MH, short for modern human, I'm always referencing African homo sapiens. That's what it means, uh, because uh, some of what we'll be talking about, um, clearly um, they were way too young to be modern humans, but they were African homo sapiens ancestrally, okay? Um, so besides ancient DNA, the other technology that's accrued in the last uh, 10 years or so are what's known as uh, proteinomics. That is the use of proteins uh, to um, figure out uh, how old something is. And the difference is that uh, the limit currently for ancient DNA um, in an actual study is the, the recent Greenland study uh, where they dated um, uh, 150 uh, uh, DNA molecules to 2 million years. That's the oldest we've gotten. Ancient proteins, on the other hand, are much, much more ancient, survival, uh, have ancient survivability. Um, uh, the problem is proteins don't carry nearly as much information as DNA does. Uh, so only about 1% of the maximum information that you can get from a, a DA uh, specimen. And basically, proteinomics uses, uh, that's misspelled up there, um, tandem mass spectrometry uh, to look at collagen proteins uh, most frequently. And those can go back hundreds of millions of years, basically. Doesn't give us much information, but occasionally it will give us a, a species uh, connection. So as examples, uh, uh, collagen in uh, 3.4 million year old uh, camel bones in the Arctic or uh, 3.8 million year old eggshell proteins in Central Africa where we have almost no ancient uh, DNA. So <clears throat> this is another technique for uh, figuring out uh, what's happening and sometimes give, being able to get uh, species and phylogenetic uh, connections. So here are uh, a number of things that have been looked at that are millions of years old, like uh, the camel, the eggshells, a uh, herbivore dinosaur uh, that's been dated 195 million years ago, <clears throat> and some um, million-year-old rhinoceros teeth from Georgia, as example. And most famous recently was that they used this technique to identify um, both the Denisovan jawbone, which I'll tell you a bit later if we get that far, and also Denny, the famous uh, 90K um, Neanderthal mother Denisovan uh, father hybrid that they found at the Denisova cave. Uh, they think that the age estimate uh, limit for ancient DNA is probably 2.6 million years because that's the age of permafrost, uh, which happened after a warming period, basically. Um, I'm personally waiting for them to find either a Homo erectus in deep 
a deep cold permafrost, or even better, a Neanderthal who was wearing trousers like say, uh, Charlie. Say, yes. Uh, don't you think it'd be more interesting to see if they wore briefs or boxers? <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Okay. Um, we know that um, uh, Homo sapiens uh, did eventually, uh, 20K or so, uh, were using underwear of some kinds as well. So via ancient DNA, um, you can basically uh, get information like population histories genetically, uh, human migrations. You can get relationships of ancestral to descendant. You can get relationships between different genetic communities, uh, disease patterns, uh, uh, historical uh, pandemic information, and social structure and kinship uh, practices, as we'll see. Okay. Um, very quickly, uh, run through the fact that uh, all modern Europeans basically are a mix of three ancestral genetic groups. There were the original African uh, uh, hunter-gatherers, then the Anatolian Neolithic farmers came in at around 8,000, and eventually at around 4,000, the steep uh, Yamnaya uh, group comes in and takes over Europe, basically. Um, so multiple migrations coming in. They didn't used to think it was uh, migratory, but they, the new data convincingly shows that the genetic combinations were due to migrations, not just cultural stuff. Um, and um, anatomically, a modern uh, hunter-gatherers were widely uh, present in Europe by at least... 45K, uh, the oldest uh, one, uh, among the oldest one is the Awasi one fossil, uh, which um, uh, was a hybrid basically in the sense that his, uh, he had a, a fourth or sixth great uh, grandfather who was a full Neanderthal. Um, and this group though was a genetic dead end. So no, modern uh, DNA contains it, but the fossil uh, did. So we've got multiple uh, migrations um, in terms of first the African move into Europe, uh, then the um, early farmers moving into Europe, and then finally uh, the Bronze Age uh, sleep uh, Russia um, uh, input. So basically, you can uh, say that we're all Russians eventually, okay, besides being African in this uh, sense. Um, the other issue, though, is if you're living in Europe, um, you ended up having multiple Ice Age uh, recurrences, which meant that uh, uh, Europe was repopulated by hunter-gatherers um, uh, who would live further north when it was warmer, then uh, head south into um, uh, Spain and Italy, basically, as refugia during this period, and then come back uh, when it got uh, warmer. Uh, and uh, during one warming period, around 15K, uh, they replaced, basically, uh, most of the uh, hunter-gatherers uh, that had been there formerly. And a recent study uh, indicates that what we used to think of as a kind of universal uh, Gravitian uh, period uh, around 35K or so actually was made up of uh, about eight different genetic hunter-gatherer groups. And it turned out the Spanish refugia was correct, but the Italian one, um, those uh, the people that ended up repopulating going north from Italy actually came from a land bridge that connected Italy to the Balkans. And that group, the Balkan group, is the one that came into Europe. So lots of mixing and matching, basically. So uh, the Anatolian farmers uh, come from the southeast around 9K um, and start to kind of marginalize the hunter-gatherers. 
And for a long time, these two actually lived side by side without genetically intermixing, but then eventually did so. Um, and um, in Iberia at 7K, um, in Ireland by 5K, Scandinavia by uh, 5K. Um, uh, they were very different uh, genetically from the hunter-gatherer groups that had inhabited Europe, basically. Uh, and um, this, uh, the appearance was closely linked to the adoption of an agricultural lifestyle uh, and that this was driven by this uh, migration, basically. Um, the farmer groups brought a lighter pigmentation uh, as well, and uh, the uh, steppe ancestry brought in lactose uh, tolerance, as an example. Um, and uh, eventually, at around 4K, uh, the two populations ended up uh, mixing it up. Um, uh, typically with about 10 to 25 percent hunter-gatherer uh, uh, ancestry. Um, and of course, different regions in Europe had different mixes, basically. Uh, the North being the last to uh, end up uh, mixing it up. And so uh, before 5,000 years, European were a mix of these two ancestral groups of uh, hunter-gatherer foragers and then a larger farmer group. Uh, and then the third group, uh, the Yamnaya, uh, enter the picture and interestingly take over in some interesting uh, ways. Um, so this is the for uh, the guys who bring these uh, large mat, large graves, uh, Bergen uh, caves where males uh, were buried basically in um, specific kinds of positions. Uh, and they're the corded ware complex uh, people uh, in terms of their description. But we've got three genetically different populations. So the West European hunter-gatherers uh, who contributed ancestry to all current uh, Europeans, but not so much to Near Easterners. Um, they arrived around 45K um, and had Europe alone for probably 30,000 years, basically. And as I just mentioned, the 2023 studies show that eventually there were eight different genetic groups uh, in this population, not just uh, one. Then the East European farmers move in around 9K, bring lighter skin. Um, there's also an interesting subgroup um, called the basal uh, Eurasian population uh, that uh, was also part of this whole group. Um, uh, let's say. Um, and the Yamnaya around 4K basically come in. They have this particular corded where pottery, they're cattle herders, they use wheel and horses. They bring Proto-Indo-European language with them. That's the current theory of how, uh, like all the Romance languages, et cetera, are so similar to each other. Um, and uh, interestingly, they, uh, they not only went west into Europe, but the MNI also went east into India, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and the Indian subcontinent uh, genetically were part of what was called the ancient North Indians and then the ancient South Indians. Everyone in mainland India today is a genetic mix of ancestry related to West Eurasians an ancestry uh, that uh, from East Asian and South Asian populations. There are no groups in India that can claim genetic purity, despite what the current prime minister uh, would like to say. Reich's group uh, was able to es ex estimate the fraction of genetics in each of these groups. Uh, West Eurasian mixture in India 
range from as low as 20% to as high as 80. And they uh, clearly had uh, connections to the caste system. The heaviest uh, Yamnaya grouping ended up being the um, uh, Brahmin higher caste system. The lesser amounts ended up in the lowest caste system. Um, so gr groups in India that speak Indo-European languages, um, let's say, um, have more Northern ancestry than those speaking the Dravidian languages in the South. Um, and uh, again, genetic connection to social status, higher social status, being the Yamnaya group, uh, lower social status being the Southern uh, Dravidian group. Um, so uh, an interesting mix, but nobody is pure. Uh, but this also raises issues about how uh, genetics can be used politically uh, because the, the current uh, Hindu biased uh, political group um, uh, there was some backlash. So the current Indian Prime Minister Modi is known to support a Hindu uh, uh, slanted narrative of the country and rejects the idea that this um, uh, other group migrated into India and displaced the country's indigenous population. The rejection of this migration theory is something endorsed by uh, the current uh, uh, main party that... Uh, Modi leads. The archaeologists said they wanted to see how the mutations and mixing of genes in the Indian population had happened over the last 10,000 years. They just wanted a scientific explanation for the data. And one of the progressive leaders uh, said, is the Modi government spreading Hitler's trail? What does profiling of uh, uh, purity of race signify, which is what Modi was advocating? Uh, and they went as far as procuring DNA kits to study racial purity of the population. So this genetic stuff can get uh, political at times as uh, the Indian population. The other feature of the Indian uh, uh, population is that they are a massive example of founder uh, event effects, okay? And we know that the original population, say Africa, has uh, hundreds and thousands of uh, allele variants, basically. And if a subgroup of a couple of hundred move out to somewhere else, this group has only a subset of the original variation, basically. Uh, differing uh, in the different new populations, uh, and they always have less var variation than you have in the original group. So uh, we talked to our patrons about the fact that the further away from uh, Africa you get uh, distance-wise, the less genetically variable you are. Uh, so every move that the African population leaving Africa at 50K did um, in different population, small population groups ended up with different lower variable DNA. Um, and this also um, uh, has the point that so, uh, selection to remove uh, deleterious disease-causing variants uh, doesn't work so well in the smaller groups, which means that you have increased risk of recessive uh, diseases, the classic example, Tay-Sachs in Ashkenazi Jews, uh, also the Amish, the Finns, et cetera. Uh, and in India, it is profoundly true, okay, where founder uh, effects, 30% of Indian groups experience population bottlenecks because of these moves uh, as strong as the ones that occur in Ashkenazi Jews, as an example. Uh, and many of these population bottlenecks in India were exceedingly old. One subgroup, the Visaya, of southern India have a reaction to uh, being given uh, an injection that paralyzes you. They have serious reactive problems to that. 
Uh, and so you have to know this background in order not to give them certain kinds of medication. Okay. Um, uh, so, Charlie, yes. Can I ask a quick question? Uh, I don't know much about the Aryan race. I don't know if it's a myth or not, but the Nazis sent people to research it. And now the prime minister of India feels that they're related to these Aryans. Was it an Aryan race or not? Aryan was simply the uh, one of the names given to the um, Yamnaya steep uh, caucus population that entered uh, Europe. And the, the Nazis ended up using some archaeological uh, theory that basically said uh, we are all blonde hair, tall, white, um, uh, description that only the best uh, came through this migration uh, issue. So um, not, nobody usually uses Aryan anymore except uh, to refer to that political perspective from the, the Nazi era. Uh, most now talk about the Amnaya uh, as being the group. Uh, and here, as an example, and it's the steep related ancestry basically that entered both Europe uh, and um, India. Uh, this is the steep in orange, uh, the original hunter gatherers in India, and also the Iranian farmer groups that also moved in. So again, uh, no pure uh, uh, mixes in India. Everybody's a mix, basically. So two parallel movements, basically. Farmers in Anatolia, Turkey move into Europe, and they also move into India. Uh, and uh, by 5,000 years, they're in both places, basically. Um, then come the Amnaya at around 4,000, uh, moving basically into both regions. Uh, so mixed populations, basically. And so the Amnaya basically is what uh, Modi is referencing as the Aryan uh, theory, basically. Uh, the other interesting thing is that the Amnaya practice uh, had big effects on the Y chromosome predominance in these populations. Maternally inherited mitochondrial uh, sequences changed very little in these areas. So uh, women, native women, were basically um, ending up with Yamnaya spouses was the pattern in both places, okay? Sometimes the Yamnaya replaced the local guys by 80 to 90%, basically. And they're the ones that ended up having the children, okay? So, uh, you know, this is the classical... Um, uh, nasty way to take over a population basically uh, so and it happened in these regions as well so today you end up having yamnaya based y chromosomes in these populations and mitochondrial dna that's regional based on the country of origin basically um, so uh, a little summary uh, ancestral North Indians related to the steep in Iran. Ancestral South uh, Indians were the indigenous East and South Asian uh, groups. There were a number of languages, but the Indo-European was brought in by the Amnaya. Uh, and uh, the South Indians could have as much as 30% Iranian farmer, but not uh, so much uh, steep ancestry. Um, but by 4,000 K, you basically end up having this uh, steep pastoralist uh, genetics in uh, both Europe and India. Uh, and with the Amnaya comes the reason why Sanskrit is like Greek and Latin, etc. Uh, so, uh, Charlie, yeah, you're saying that the instead of being like Neanderthals and humans, you know, they kind of got along. These guys came and conquered, you know, wiped out the males and made it with the females. Not, not 
nobody's saying conquered. Oh, but okay? they marginalized. I mean, that could be a they, they ended well. up yeah. marginalizing the males. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it's like a um, euphemism for, uh, you know, because obviously the local guys couldn't compete, you know, physically, I assume. Right. Okay. Because it may be, it may have been simply that uh, these guys had uh, all the the food and the dwellings and that was attractive to females. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's the way it went, basically. So all groups in South Asia are admixtures, basically. Uh, this, there are similar patterns seen in both Europe and India in terms of Iranian and steep ancestry. Um, and then India experienced this demographic transformation because um, once these small groups ended up coming there, they ended up practicing endogamy, which is don't marry anybody else, leading to strong founder effects and um, problems with their genetics, basically. There are more than 80 groups with founder events stronger than those seen in Ashkenazi Jews and the Finns, basically. Um, Charlie, what okay. other advances did they have besides language? Why do they displace the indigenous males? That That's the question. I don't think that's been answered, actually. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, there are some interpreted as uh, coming in and conquering. Um, uh, there's uh, There was a new study, as an example, from a couple of weeks ago, where um, the same thing happened with, um, uh, let me think, Persian uh, princesses coming to the coast of Africa and ending up having the same effect in areas of uh, coastal Africa, um, where uh, the Persian Y chromosome ended up being the predominant one. And so, clearly that one was not a conquering uh, episode because uh, the main power structures in uh, the African region was female, okay? Uh, so I think it's a complex issue. There's that a prejudice in India about lighter skin being better uh, as associated with the upper class. Was this the same situation, do you think? Did, did these people who came Probably. in with lighter skin and they were seen as more valuable or godlike or something, do you think? All probable. Okay, that's all I can basically say from what I've read. See, um, Charlie, so. did they, they domesticated the horse, right? So they had an advantage of all other peoples, right? That was another thing that the Amnaya were famous for. Well, they yeah, were a horse amazing, culture. Yeah. yeah. So that they brought in. Um, okay. Um, ba, 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 ba. Um, um, <clears throat> there's some weird stuff about, um, uh, as we'll see, uh, about uh, y X chromosomes uh, in uh, the uh, uh, Neanderthal population. So um, it turns out that in modern humans, uh, modern X chromosome is devoid of Neanderthal DNA, implying that there probably was some kind of male human Neanderthal hybrids may not may have been infertile. Uh, only the female hybrids proved to be fertile uh, because uh, it turns out um, modern humans have no Neanderthal Y chromosomes. So the Y chromosome did not survive the introgression of uh, Neanderthals into modern humans. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Interestingly, Neanderthals have long been seen as this uber-masculine hunk compared to modern <laughs> humans, but a 2020 study basically says Homo sapiens men essentially emasculated their brawny brethren when they mated with Neanderthal women, that these unions cause modern Y chromosomes to sweep through the future generation of Neanderthal boys, eventually replacing the Neanderthal Y chromosome. Okay. So that in the last period 
of uh, Europe around 45K uh, or so, Neanderthals had modern human Y chromosomes. Okay, take that for an <laughs> interesting scenario. Um, it gets even more complicated. Um, so early modern human men mated with Neanderthal women. Uh, their sons carried the modern human Y chromosome, which is paternally inherited. The modern Y then rapidly spread through the offspring of these small populations uh, of Neanderthals in Europe and Asia, replacing the Neanderthal Y. Um, so the modern human um, mates were not ancestral to today's uh, uh, Homo sapiens, but were likely a part of the population that migrated out of Africa and then went extinct. Um, you know, so, well, go ahead. Oh, it, it's just that I would think it would be the same story. Uh, it, in usual edge cases of mating between species, it's the females who are fertile and the males who are sterile. And I think that was probably just as true of modern human males mixing it up with Neanderthal females. And it's, it's because yeah. females good point. get X chromosomes, but you know, the X and Y chromosome is, is fragile. So yeah, uh, this may, you know, I think there's point. another, yeah, there's another explanation like that. that's sociological, that if the modern humans, for example, were better hunters or had better weapons, and they raided the Neanderthals, they would steal the women. And I think that's not a, a atypical thing. The dominant male species who comes into an area gets the, gets the, gets the gals. And that might have been well, contributed to this. Yes, the problem, part of the problem uh, with um, theorizing about this is uh, that's potentially all it will ever be at yeah. our st our point of technology because you can't prove it yet. <laughs> okay, um, right. because yeah, it's one of the reasons why uh, we're we're sort of still uh, in the dark. Um, Was there any evidence that the modern humans had better weapons? Or did they have spears? The big uh, one of the big issues is um, when when did bow and arrows come into play? Classically, um, my reading of it was not until about twenty k, right, which is twenty thousand years later than when we met the Neanderthals. Right. And the other question is, um, I reviewed that with some of you about the uh, Mandarin France. Um, papers about finding a layer that has have these incredible arrow points that have been attributed to modern humans rather than the Neanderthals at the site. <laughs> so we simply don't know. Uh, the, the paper concluded that they were modern human arrowheads, and it was 10,000 years before um, uh, the final disappearance of uh, Neanderthal. Uh, the other weird finding historically was um, that the Cima de los Huesos um, uh, group uh, in Spain, when they finally did the DNA and showed that they were, uh, it was around 420K and that they were Neanderthals, definitely, uh, by Y chromosome, um, but I'm, I'm sorry, by nuclear not just Y chromosome, but nuclear DNA. But the first uh, studies looked at the mitochondrial DNA, and that was Denisovan-like, okay? Not, um, not modern human or uh, specifically Neanderthal. Um, so that's been an ongoing question how uh, that happened. Uh, and um, so African... Modern human interbreeding with Neanderthal has replaced the a Neanderthal Y chromosome around 270 or so, uh, they think. Uh, at least one Neanderthal male with a, a mo uh, modern human Y chromosome had Neanderthal sons that spread it, basically. Uh, hey, Charlie? This also gets into the question of 
uh, is Neanderthal a species different than us, et cetera, et cetera. Question? Uh, the question I had was brought up, uh, you mentioned that Persian, when you mentioned Africa, you mentioned Persian princesses married uh, Africans. Was that to cement treaties and things between Persia and Africa? I mean, this is obviously comes way later than the time period you're talking about, I assume. Yeah, that's about eight or 10,000 uh, or so. Um, uh, just this, um, apparently, um, the Africans had an oral tradition of this being true, uh, but there was no evidence that it was true until the DNA was done recently, showing that the, the male um, uh, fossils uh, had lots of this uh, Persian uh, DNA in it. Um, so that uh, the, there was a group historically that apparently uh, came from Persia. They were sailors, basically, ended up in Africa and basically started trading with Persia, got rich, and then ended up intermarrying with the African women who were in charge of the population. Okay, So that's one way to do it. Um, the um, OK. Uh, so but you said they were Persian princesses, or is that just the uh, males. The, uh, story? Oh, males, just males only. There were no women right. exchange between Persia right. and Right, it Africa. was mainly the DNA talks about the male Persians. Oh, okay. Basically. Right. Okay. So female modern humans and male Neanderthals weren't fully compatible, uh, and male Neanderthals may have had problems with sperm production. Uh, there's this whole question of whether male Neanderthals ended up being uh, uh, sterile when they were hybrids. Uh, we inherited most of our Neanderthal genes through hybrid females, basically. The El Cedron Neanderthals in Spain had mutations in three immune genes. One produced antigens that can elicit an immune response in pregnant women, causing them to reject and miscarry male fetuses with those genes. So that's one uh, possibility. Uh, so male Neanderthals and female modern humans uh, probably hooked up more than once over the ages. They may have been unable to produce healthy male babies, uh, which may have been part of the reason why uh, Neanderthals ended up going extinct. Um, and 10 of 10 Neanderthal mitochondrial sequences are outside the current mito, uh, modern human range. So suggesting that mating of modern human males with Neanderthal females generated non-viable uh, progeny. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much what that says. Then I want to run through what I think is an interesting um, uh, this is my discovery um, of uh, what I call the 15 known introgression events from around uh, 300K to recently, where there, there were papers published that showed that there was an introgression of, uh, event going uh, in every possible direction and in every possible species, okay? So here we go. Uh, so I'm going to give each of these an individual look, uh, basically. Um, but let's say, before we start there, I want to distinguish the fact that Neanderthals were not a single genetic population. Uh, from my reading, I can, uh, there are at least four different subgroups of Neanderthals. Um, one is uh, the El Cedron, uh Spain group. Uh, the second is uh, Vindicia Croatia group. This is the group that they got the uh, first Neanderthal nuclear DNA from the three bones from this cave, basically. And uh, both of these have significant uh, gene flow between them. Okay. Then, way further east, the Altay uh, Denisova cave. Neanderthal is a different genetic group from these two. And then in the Caucasus, there's uh, the uh, Mesmaisakaya one, and this is an 
infant uh, Neanderthal uh, that was discovered. So four different, uh, slightly genetically different groups. They think that the Alte uh, group separated from the first two at around 110K. Okay. Uh, and part of this, the differences may have been because of, again, the population crash during the cold uh, and the recolonization that basically some survived, some didn't, some mixed, some didn't, basically. The Alcidron and Vendesia uh, are more closely related than the Altaya uh, Neanderthal is to the Neanderthals that interbred with us at around 60K. Modern humans share more alleles with the Vindinja and Mesmaskaya than with the Altai group. Um, I'm still not totally sure that I know uh, or that has actually been published which of these groups are the ones that we actually mixed with at 60K. Okay, mm -hmm. so just, that's uh, something I'm still not positive about. Um, and, um, but one study indicated that Neanderthal derived DNA in us is more closely related to the genome of the Mesmiskaya skeleton than to the Altai or to the Mendinja. So it may be this uh, group that's out in the Caucasus, right? Not in uh, the Levant where they think the admixture often is commentated upon. Um, and, um, Okay, well, skip that. An, an important point, um, just to clarify about El Cedron. This is a famous cave where they've discovered 12 Neanderthal skeletons, three female, three male, three adolescents, two juveniles, and one infant. They think it was potentially a massacre. There was some cannibalism involved, but the DNA is fabulous. <laughs> it basically indicates that uh, kin, uh, this group was a kin-related group. This was a family, basically. Um, and uh, that they practiced patrilocal mating. That is, that uh, outs, uh, outside Neanderthal women came to the male uh, group. And there's other evidence that this was the Neanderthal pattern like it is in some modern patterns as well, that basically uh, the, the local brothers basically ended up going to find women uh, from other groups of Neanderthals and bringing them home, and that became the, the group. So um, the brothers in uh, the, uh, the subgroups tend to be related, um, whereas the women, uh, their mitochondrial is different than the group in uh, the male group, okay? And there's also evidence from this group that um, uh, Neanderthals had longer interbirth intervals of about three years uh, compared to a shorter or modern humans, okay? So it's an important group, uh, and it's one of the subdirect uh, subgroups. Uh, so homo uh, promiscuous, okay, in terms of Everybody is mating with uh, everybody else, basically, uh, as we'll see. Um, so I'm going to do the quick review of these 15 interactions. Um, and part of this uh, is based on the, the idea that we can look at a modern human genome and identify that there is a, uh, a region in there that is unlike uh, uh, any other found, basically, indicating that it's an extinct group that no longer is alive, but has some DNA in the current genome, okay? It explains some of the weird variants. Um, so it's evidence for a previously unknown species of archaic human uh, that ends up in a modern day population. Um, and Historically, we've had to use uh, what are called reference DNA sequence, like the, uh, the original um, 2000 or so human DNA project that produced the, the current model of 
what the three billion base pairs are for a modern human. Uh, uh, and they then started using that to match any of the newer archaic findings to say that this one is modern humans, this one is Neanderthal, this one is Denisovan, etc. cetera. Um, now you can actually use statistics rather than a reference genome. Um, they've got amazingly advanced statistics to be able to do this. And basically uh, a modern population can trace a percentage of its genetic ancestry is being different than everybody else's. So you can identify a base pair section of DNA that's different from the known modern human, Neanderthal, Denisovan genome. Uh, so you can do this statistically now. Um, and then you can then conclude that there's an unknown ghost population that was around but went extinct, basically. And all we have is this section of DNA that tells us that they were alive. And this is a graphic version of simply um, uh, modern humans over here, Neanderthals, Denisovans, probably Homo erectus, et cetera, and everybody was mating, okay, is the current conclusion. Every time we met somebody, we hooked up, okay? Mm -hmm. um, the first um, important study was uh, uh, pulling out Neanderthal mitochondrial uh, in 1997 and uh, uh, out of the Neanderthal one femur bone that was the type specimen for Neanderthals, they got 379 base pairs uh, and they compared them to almost a thousand human lineages. And the conclusion then was there was no interbreeding between Neanderthals and modern humans based on mitochondria. We've since discovered, of course, that there is uh, no Neanderthal mitochondria in the human gene pool, okay, which is what led to this conclusion. In 2008, um, uh, they do uh, the Croatian Neanderthal uh, mitochondrial sequence, uh, again, uh, concluded uh, no Neanderthal mitochondria is found in modern humans, basically. Uh, the most famous introgression is the one reported by Green et al. in 2010, that uh, it, looking at the nuclear genome, uh, finding that there is Neanderthal DNA in modern humans. So there's a positive evidence for the admixture published in 2010. And this originally estimated it to be one to 4% Neanderthal. It's since been refined to 1.5 to 2.1% is the one you should use. Uh, in terms of talking about it. Uh, so 20% of Neanderthal, all Neanderthal DNA survives in current uh, mo uh, modern humans. That's now been re revised to say that 40% uh, of the entire Neanderthal genome exists in modern populations today. So there's more Neanderthal DNA today than there ever was when Neanderthals were on the planet. Okay, so uh, ancestral DNA in us. Um, so they dated, in, in this uh, study, they dated the admixture to being around 40 to 60K, that it was uh, uh, eventually 1.5 to 2.1. And originally they stated that there was more Neanderthal DNA in East Asians than in Europeans. This has now been discounted because uh, they were not counting African. They, uh, uh, they weren't, there is African Neanderthal DNA and that was not excluded, et cetera, et cetera. So they now think that East and West are uh, similar in terms of the amount of DNA. Um, and that there were multiple introgressions from Neanderthals into various modern human populations outside of Africa, uh, resulting in the 2%. And this is simply a quick chart. This is the modern human genome, the top line. This is mitochondrial Eve. And these are four different Neanderthals. The four different Neanderthals look amazingly similar, okay, but different from uh, the modern human genome. Okay, so if you 
look, C is here, but A is in us kind of routine. Um, so different uh, genomes, basically, in certain parts. Uh, the four Neanderthals uh, in this uh, are pretty ho homogeneous, basically. Uh, and uh, they think uh, there was a divergence between humans and Neanderthals somewhere between 740 and 300K or so. Most say about 700 or so. Second introgression. Neanderthal DNA into Denisovans and um, unfortunately, I can't see my top row. Okay. And D Denisovan DNA into Neanderthals. Okay. Um, these were teeth dating to ADK from Denisova, had uh, Neanderthal DNA. The, a prior study confirmed the existence via DNA of a third group of ancient hominins, the Denisovans. We'll talk to at the end of this if we get there. Uh, and there are also indications of early Neanderthal and Denisovan interbreeding. So basically, Neanderthals and humans uh, diverged around 700K, and then Neanderthals and Denisovans diverged around 4, 300K or so. Okay. Um, Number three, archaic hominin into Denisovan DNA and therefore then into some modern humans. So a 2011 study basically shows that uh, the Denisovan genome has about 0.5 to 8% later changed to 3 to 6% of an archaic hominin. Okay. Since this was an Eastern Asian a group, the Denisovans, the suspicion is who was in China, basically, uh, that whole region. Uh, Indonesia, it was Homo erectus. So the suspicion is that the super archaic uh, group uh, was, in fact, Homo erectus. That also means that uh, modern humans who have Denisovan DNA also have some potentially Homo erectus DNA, but we've never found a Homo erectus to get DNA from, okay? So separate issue. Um, so this is an example of a ghost species phenomena where you look at the DNA and some part of it doesn't look correct, basically. And they've timed it that um, the archaic amount came from uh, a divergence around 1 to 1.4 million years ago, which makes it even more likely that it was Homo erectus. Okay. Number four, archaic Asian hominin DNA into modern humans, uh, a study that uh, from uh, a non-functional region of the X chromosome. Uh, the origin for the sequence, uh, not in Africa, but in East Asia, around 1.5 million years ago. Again, was it Homo erectus? Um, and then, um, this is the fabulous one, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, a subgroup of African Homo sapiens ancestors ended up in Germany somewhere around 270K. Uh, and um, there, there is this, uh, let's see, got to get this straight, uh, so I'll read it. Around 3% of Neanderthal DNA, possibly as much as 6%, came from modern humans who mated with Neanderthals uh, more than 200,000 years ago, which means that we were having a constant dribble of uh, modern humans ending up leaving Africa way before the 60K event, okay? We know from Jabal or Hood that uh, there were modern humans in North Africa by 300K, uh, so this easily could have been some subset of these kinds of African groups uh, leaving. Um, and uh, 
So Neanderthals who gave us 2% already had 3% of modern human DNA in their DNA, okay? So it gets complicated. Um, they did a sampling of two Africans to Neanderthal, one Denisov and one chimpanzee, uh, using a statistical methodology and identified that 3% Neanderthal genome is introgressed from modern humans, basically, in a gene flow event that occurred two to 300,000 years ago. Um, and that this uh, uh, 3% uh, it, is in both the Altai and uh, Vendinja Neanderthal subgroups, basically. Um, and only about 0.3% uh, are in the Denisovan group uh, of this subset. So Neanderthals were mixing, I'm sorry, modern humans were mixing it up with Neanderthals uh, a while ago. Um, in 2016, um, uh, Svan Pavo said that the Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA is actually modern human, okay? So this is the Germany that I mentioned wrongly earlier, that there was a femur from the Hollenstein Stadel cave in Germany that was discovered in 1937, and then they did the DNA and discovered, lo and behold, some early modern human female mated with a Neanderthal male more than 270,000 years ago. Her African mitochondrial DNA completely replaced the Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA. In this specific Neanderthal genetic subgroup, okay, we, we think that uh, this group went extinct, all right? So that's the, uh, uh, the caution in this regard. But amazingly, um, uh, this modern human mitochondrial DNA spread uh, throughout a large subgroup of the Neanderthal population, basically. Uh, so modern humans into uh, Neanderthals, uh, basically. Uh, one female modern human interbred with one Neanderthal male. She had hybrid Neanderthal uh, modern human child who inherited her mitochondrial. Her female Neanderthal descendants spread that mitochondria to all later Neanderthals, replacing the original uh, Denisovan-like mitochondrial DNA, basically. This may be why the Cima de los Huesos Neanderthals ended up having Denisovan-like uh, DNA. Um, so we've got Africans uh, mixing it up with Neanderthals in Germany basically uh, producing this uh, African mitochondrial DNA in Neanderthals. This is the bone that uh, they used uh, to get the DNA from. Um, and so talk about complex history of interchange of uh, DNA, basically. Um, so the oldest uh, Neanderthal mitochondrial DNAs are the one dated from SEMA, 430K, Denisovan-like, the German one at around 124K, and the Altai one uh, from around 130. So we've got different mitochondrial DNA showing up in Neanderthals at various periods. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, uh, the uh, German one almost certainly went extinct, okay? So the final group of Neanderthals uh, did not have mitochondria from modern humans, uh, is my reading of the data, um, but amazingly interesting. Um, okay, uh, so the mitochondria of, of these German Neanderthals is uh, not actually from Neanderthals, but from early African humans. Um, okay. This is the same. Uh, so um, 
they think the German group was eventually replaced by the Alte uh, Neanderthals, who ended up uh, that genetic version of Neanderthals was the one that mostly was around uh, in the final period of their existence. Um, number seven, introgression is modern human into nuclear uh, uh, genome, uh, Neanderthal genome in the Middle East at around 100K. Uh, so again, an ancient population of Homo sapiens migrated from Africa into Asia, and they think that in the Middle East they met some Neanderthals, basically. Uh, and uh, the modern human DNA in the genome of a female Neanderthal uh, from the, the Nisaba cave is where they got this data. Um, but this was not in the Western uh, Neanderthals. Uh, skip. So the current conclusion um, is that uh, there was a divergence of modern humans from Neanderthals dated to 550 to 750 or so. And that the Denisovans and the Neanderthals split up at around 400K or so, okay? So um, uh, different divergence dates based on mitochondrial molecular clockwork. Um, and again, uh, the idea of um, uh, that their male human Neanderthal hybrids may have been infertile, basically, was part of the, the discussion. Uh, number eight, Altai Neanderthals into East Asian modern humans at around 100K. Uh, so there was a lot happening before 60K, obviously, is what part of this is all indicating. Uh, number nine, um, modern human into the Alte at around 100K. Uh, and uh, the uh, modern human genome into Neanderthals took place after the separation of Alte Neanderthals from the other two groups, basically at about 110K. Uh, then we get Neanderthal DNA into Denisovans, at least. 0.5% uh, Neanderthal uh, DNA is in Denisovan DNA. Um, and uh, at 90K, the discovery of Denny, who was a uh, Neanderthal mother, Denisovan father, uh, that they interbred as well and produced at least one hybrid that we know of. Uh, and here's a, just a graphic uh, of uh, these are the Neanderthals. These are the humans. Uh, we get Alte into Denisovans. We get modern humans into the Alte. We get uh, Western um, Neanderthals into uh, the Han, the New Guineans, the French. <laughs> okay. Um, so lots of mixing. Um, and I, I mentioned earlier that the OSA-1 um, Romanian uh, skeleton showed that uh, uh, modern human hunter-gatherers had uh, Neanderthal DNA by 45K, basically. Uh, this guy had the most that they've ever discovered, up to 9% was a Neanderthal, indicating that he had a, a full Neanderthal uh, sixth-generation grand parent, basically. So, uh, and note, uh, his skull looked hybridized, basically, uh, low slanting. Uh, and I would consider that an occipital bun, basically. Uh, so uh, still some heavy Neanderthal DNA going on with him. More famously, back in 98, uh, um, Eric Trinkhaus uh, uh, pushed the idea that this Portuguese uh, Lagarvello child skeleton was basically a hybrid. Uh, and most people now think he was absolutely uh, correct. Um, 12, Denisovan DNA into modern humans. Uh, so that today 
uh, Melanesians, uh, New Guineans have two to six percent Denisovan DNA, and that they think this happened around 45k. Uh, but uh, the Southern Denisovan group, there are now we believe that there are two or three different Denisovan lineages, just like there are Neanderthal lineages, uh, but that the Papua New Guineans um, uh, got a huge dose of Denisovans, basically. Um, then archaic hominin into modern humans in Africa. So um, there's a, um, a gene that's in uh, an antibacterial salivary gene mucin uh, that originated in an unknown African population and integrated into modern African population. So it's a ghost population, basically, in Africa, uh, not uh, anywhere else. And then um, in the San, there's also uh, some archaic DNA, a ghost population, about 2% of their group. Um, and we note that the San are descendants of the earliest diversification event in the history of all humans. Basically, that um, around 260K, uh, they divided from some other modern day population uh, and now are believed to have the most genetically diverse subpopulation in Africa. So uh, there was a lot of things going on in Africa, just like there was a lot of interaggression going on in uh, non-Africa uh, places. And finally, um, a ghost lineage in four West African groups, the Yorba, Asan, Gambia, and Mende, uh, that two to 19% of their DNA are from archaic ghost lineages. So there was a lot of mixing and matching going on in Africa, just like there was every place else. Um, and um, so ghost populations, all over the place, basically. Um, and there, uh, we should note there was a, um, I mentioned the basal uh, Eurasian group. And the thing that distinguishes them is that these are Africans that left Africa, but managed not to get any Neanderthal DNA. Okay, so somehow they ended up isolated somewhere where they got no contact to anybody that had been introgressed by Neanderthals, basically. Um, yeah, so that sometime after 60K, this group got isolated. And uh, while the rest of us bumped into mated with Neanderthals, they didn't. And that's their major characteristic, basically. Um, OK. And as an example of um, uh, African, uh, the Eo Iluri Nigeria skull here, uh, I would immediately jump to Neanderthal, okay, uh, in terms of slant, uh, brow ridge. Uh, but this uh, is dated to around 15K, very late. There were no more Neanderthals, uh, but low elongated cranial shape. Uh, and probably this is an example of uh, an integration from an archaic uh, African species into a more modern group, basically. Okay. Um, and this is one of the reasons uh, Chris Stringer thinks that um, it was probably the Broken Hill Homo uh, Heidelbergensis um, that's now been dated to 300K, may have been one of these uh, archaic intergressors, basically. Um, uh, but there can be other uh, theories about this. This has also led to this concept of African multi-regionalism that basically you've got uh, sometimes isolated, sometimes not African subpopulations with different anatomic brain, et cetera, mixtures that eventually uh, interbred in a braided stream kind of way and ultimately produce something that looked like the Herto uh, 200K uh, modern human. Okay, so that's what was going on in Africa at this time. 
And it turns out that the Khoisan have Neanderthal DNA, okay? Even though there were never any Neanderthals in uh, Africa. So how did this happen? Uh, basically, um, there was an influx into Eastern Africa of some um, modern humans with Neanderthal uh, DNA from Eurasia somewhere that ended up uh, around 2,200 years ago, intermixing with a subgroup, uh, the Khoikwadi uh, a group of Khoisan, and um, ended up, they ended up with around 14% of West Eurasian uh, ancestry, including about 0.03% Neanderthal DNA. So you can now tell people that in Africa, the average is about 0.03 Neanderthal DNA. I used to say all uh, non-Africans had Neanderthal DNA and Africans didn't. That's been now disproved, okay? So 0.03% uh, uh, in this group. Uh, some- So Charlie, East, there are yeah. no human species then that do not have some Neanderthal DNA. Right, no modern. No modern humans exist. Species. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody has some. Um, the Yoruba, the Khoisan, some um, uh, East African tribes um, uh, from which the Khoikwadi descend have up to 50% Eurasian DNA. Okay, so some of the lighter mixtures um, pigment wise, uh, is, this is part of the reason. Uh, okay, uh, so again, every time subgroups met, different species met, um, uh, intermixture, intergression, okay? So um, what have been the functional genetic effects of Neanderthal DNA in modern humans, okay? Um, let's say. Okay, um, so we know um, 1.8 to 2.6 modern uh, uh, genomes have uh, Neanderthal DNA, 0.03 from Africa, um, and above are averages for the whole genome. Uh, some specific genomic areas contain 60% Neanderthal DNA. Okay, so it just depends where uh, in um, you find it. Um, and um, we now know um, that there are both Neanderthal deserts in modern human DNA, um, as an example, like the X chromosome, the testes. Um, and uh, they give us hints as to what's important uh, to make us modern humans, basically. Uh, there are no Neanderthal mitochondrial or Y DNA currently exists, uh, but there has been retention of some beneficial Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA. Um, and so there is Neanderthal DNA in current modern humans. Uh, some weird like uh, Neanderthal DNA is associated with smoking behavior. Okay. We don't know the original function of that Neanderthal DNA because as far as we know, they weren't smoking tobacco, okay? So uh, genes may have played some radically different thing in live Neanderthals than it does in live modern humans, basically. Um, most Neanderthal variants are associated with diseases, type two diabetes, lupus, Crohn's, obesity, depression risk, COVID risk, okay? But there are also uh, beneficial uh, effects like uh, immunity uh, receptors. We know because of those immunity receptors that uh, they tend to occasionally be hypersensitive but, and they protect us from getting ulcer creating bacteria like uh, H. Uh, pylori, but also as a consequence of their being hypersensitive, we get uh, more allergies. Okay, 
the highest genetic risk factor for COVID is Neanderthal gene, but also uh, Neanderthal DNA protects us from HIV. We know that Neanderthal DNA was especially combative with RNA viruses, that it tells us that Neanderthals had pandemics, uh, that they developed uh, antibodies for. Uh, West Nile, Hep C, COVID um, are RNA viruses as examples, okay? Um, this, uh, the moment I saw this picture, um, I said, hmm, Neanderthal, huh? Uh, so did Neanderthals uh, functionally survive in us? This is Russian boxer Nikolai uh, Valuev, uh, seven foot tall, 300 pounds, 15 years as a boxer, uh, a Russian politician uh, drafted in 2022 into the Russian army. So nobody survives Putin, basically. But uh, look at that classic Neanderthal kind of feature, okay? They think this is actually because of um, uh, giantism and uh, the facial agro something condition. Um, and uh, uh, again, uh, Eastern and Western uh, populations have equal amounts of Neanderthal DNA, unlike what was originally thought. Um, and uh, I think we, oh, well, I'll skip that. So some of the things that are functional in us today due to Neanderthal DNA in us today include pigmentation, pale skin that burns, lighter skin, uh, UV protection, longer skull morphology, uh, more sensitive pain perception, interestingly, uh, reduced pharmacological responses to certain medications. Denis Denisovans gave Tibetans the EPAS-1, anti-hypoxia, high altitude adaptation. Turns out Neanderthals had A and O uh, alleles for blood type. Uh, no B has yet been found. Um, the FOXP2 uh, gene, language gene, is present in both Neanderthals and modern humans, probably because it's from the last common ancestor, Heidelbergensis. The HAR1 human accelerated regions uh, that differentiate both of us from chimps um, are present in both of us related to brain development, uh, et cetera. Uh, low traces of Denisovan um, uh, ancestry in mainland uh, Asia, only about 0.2% Denisovan uh, is in mainland Asian and Native American populations. They still don't understand why. They found Denisovan DNA in Denisova Cape Siberia, and then a lot in Indonesia, but in between, somehow there isn't much, okay? They, they don't understand why. Uh, it may be because of population routes that they took when they ended up in Indonesia or ended up in uh, Denisova and somehow never got in between. And Melanesians, New Guinean, Fijians have 6% uh, Denisovan DNA. Um, I'm not very Neanderthal. My 23andMe says that I have 223 Neanderthal variants. That means less than 94% uh, of uh, 23andMe customers. My mom had 268. My brother had 240. Okay, so even within a family, it can differ. And this is my chromosomes. And the blue is where I have Neanderthal variants. Note that X and Y has none, as it does in everyone. But look at the recombination effects, okay? So having difficult time discarding rarely used stuff, okay? I've got two of those. <laughs> and I am uh, on the side of being more than less of a hoarder for books, minerals, etc. Less back hair. Uh, interestingly, uh, likely to sneeze after eating dark chocolate, uh, which I've never noticed. 
slightly less straight hair, an inch shorter, an inch taller, more mosquito bite itching, better sprinter than distance runner, which was true. Um, so uh, those are the kinds of connections I personally have that are known. Um, importantly, um, Neanderthal sequences tend to not be in gene areas of modern humans. They are in the junk, quote, regulatory regions. Um, so uh, whether Neanderthal sequences make any contribution to gene expression, and the answer was yes. They found a strong depletion of Neanderthal variants in coding regions of the genes and an enrichment in the more archaic uh, regulatory regions. Uh, we have 1% to 2% Neanderthal DNA today, not the 10% that was present in many modern humans at 45K. Um, but Neanderthal is not located in areas that are now functionally important for survival in modern humans. The variants don't usually fall within gene areas, but instead regulate uh, DNA by influencing where, when, and how strongly genes are activated. Okay. Um, here's the OACI at uh, eight or nine percent, basically. They didn't survive. And uh, here is the fraction of Neanderthal DNA uh, in today. Interestingly, uh, the most recent study is that the depletion of negative uh, selection due to negative selection happened very quickly, not over 40,000 years, okay? So uh, the Peter uh, study indicates that selection over time reduced Neanderthal from higher levels close to the date of the introgression down to about 2% now. But this reduction happened quite rapidly within 10 to 20 generations of interbreeding and then leveled off at 2%. Okay, that was an interesting uh, uh, study basically. So uh, it happened when they needed it, which was on their entry into Europe, which was a pathologically different uh, ecosystem basically. Um, so uh, that was an interesting study. Um, first few hundred years. Um, so some intergress Neanderthal DNA shows evidence of positive selection, that once it uh, got into us, uh, it had uh, a genetic spread, basically a, a, a genetic drive that took over that particular function. Um, and uh, basically the, the most important ones moving from a warm, uh, Africa to a slightly less warm Europe were things that met the environment like your skin, your hair, uh, and your immune cap capacities, basically. All uh, highly uh, Neanderthal involved, basically. Um, so it protected us once we moved into this uh, colder climate, decreased daylight, uh, different foods, uh, different immune requirements, basically. And basically, there were a whole series of studies uh, related to adaptive contribution of Neanderthal DNA to the modern human um, uh, system. But again, Neanderthal DNA tends to be regulatory, uh, not uh, gene region kinds of places. Uh, most of those have been deleted fairly quickly, it turns out. Uh, and in many ways, uh, Neanderthal DNA was not a good mix, basically. Long stretches have no Neanderthal DNA input at all. Um, and this indicates that genetic modifications prove negative for survival. Uh, and so uh, selective uh, uh, took it away basically and produced lots of uh, deserts. The male X chromosome um, uh, and uh, non-coding region DNA is what constitutes most of the Neanderthal uh, evidence. 
uh, and the genetic deserts were produced by, uh, they think. Uh, actually, two things may have been happening. One is negative selection, but also um, gene flow uh, interactions may also have contributed to less and less of the Neanderthal being present if they mated with uh, groups that had less Neanderthal DNA. Um, okay. Uh, so it helped our ancestors survive in prehistoric Europe. Uh, it was a very different place than where the Africans originated, different ecosystem, diets, um, bacteria, viruses that were present. And by mating with Neanderthals, uh, modern humans got this uh, big immunity advantage, basically. Um, so uh, what functional contribution? Is Neanderthal DNA genetically functional today? Um, these are all the areas where there are known Neanderthal uh, contributions, basically. Okay, we'll go through a bunch of them. So immunity genes, pigmentation, keratin, hair, uh, especially fat metabolism, height, Denisovan altitude adaptation. Um, uh, one uh, major study looked at um, uh, looking at the UK Biobank, which has health data from 500,000 Brits, all of their health data. Uh, and then all of their Neanderthal data is in there as well. 50% uh, of the Neanderthal alleles had to do with hair and skin biology. So again, our body, the entrance to an environment is our skin and our hair, uh, and that changed because of our uh, Neanderthal DNA. Uh, there was a famous uh, question about uh, Neanderthals have a version of the MCMI4, I think, gene that controls for red hair and lighter skin. Uh, this study didn't find any red hair uh, uh, data, but uh, it could suggest simply that it was very rare, which they do in fact think. Um, lighter skin, basically over 60% of people uh, uh, have a BNC2 uh, area that's uh, Neanderthal, and it's reported uh, high incidence of childhood sunburn and poor tanning ability, so lighter skin, but also some other data that shows sometimes it was olive skin tone that was also, it's a different Neanderthal subpopulations maybe. Um, some of the genes, uh, Denisovan, uh, TBX, uh, had body fat distribution, Another, uh, the EPAS-1, high altitude, is Denisovan, Neanderthal ultraviolet radiation response, innate immunity response, uh, skin pigmentation, keratin, innate immunity. So lots of immunity, lots of skin uh, changes that occurred because we have Neanderthal in us. In terms of the immunity, that are, there are what are known as toll-like receptors. Um, that we have basically inherited from uh, Neanderthals. Um, uh, a large stretch of Neanderthal DNA, 143,000 uh, base, base pairs long, three different uh, genes that are part of the innate immune system, uh, these toll-like receptors, um, and all have come from two from Neanderthals, one from Denisovans. Uh, the TLR 10, 1, and 6 basically are a first defense against bacterial uh, pathogens in our system. And uh, interestingly, the, uh, the orange is the Neanderthal uh, haplotype, basically. Okay. Um, and they spread very quickly apparently, because they were very advantageous if you had these uh, immune uh, DNA regions in your system. Um, and we think we got uh, uh, most of them from uh, Neanderthal. So clearly, spending a night with a Neanderthal gave you a big advantage over thousands of years. 
Uh, there's a Neanderthal progesterone variant, which is associated with preterm births, but also protective against miscarriage, and it results in more Lyme births. Uh, these days, doctors actually use increased progesterone in women with preterm birth risks. But Neanderthals, uh, this uh, uh, Neanderthal progesterone was really advantageous. 30% of European women inherited this receptor from Neanderthals, and it's associated with increased fertility, fewer bleedings during early pregnancy, fewer miscarriages, having uh, more children. So it was clearly advantageous. Um, there's a, a model uh, called the poison antidote model of adaptive integration. So long, frequent uh, segments of Neanderthal ancestry in modern humans are enriched for proteins that interact with viruses. These proteins interacted specifically with RNA viruses, uh, which were more likely to belong to intergressed Neanderthal. Um, and it also gives us a hint that Neanderthals had pandemics in their lifetimes that uh, were RNA-based viruses that they've learned to defend against and give us an advantage. Um, and there was a kind of uh, virus exchange between the two groups. Uh, exposure of each species to unfamiliar viruses from the other, and then later an exchange of genes that granted resistance to each of those types of viruses. So it, it went both ways. Anecdote. Um, uh, and uh, they think we may have given tapeworm, tuberculosis, stomach ulcers, herpes uh, to Neanderthals, which could have weakened the Neanderthals, one theory of Neanderthal demise. Uh, but um, we got protection from uh, H. pylora, the stomach ulcer bacteria, uh, herpes simplex. Uh, but again, because of this new immunity, it also made us more susceptible to common allergens. So it was a double-edged sword basically for us. Um, okay, uh, the first Neanderthal genomes that we got were all female. Um, and as, a, as we only have as an example, female uh, Neanderthal sexual DNA, no information on Neanderthal Y chromosome, uh, and it's never been observed in modern populations, basically. Um, and again, 50% of Neanderthal variants are skin and hair traits, basically pigmentation. Um, uh, skin color, skin tanning, skin color. Uh, we'll talk about morning, evening person in a second. Variation in inner uh, leukin uh, levels, innate immunity, toll receptors, Variation in optic disc size. Uh, we know that Neanderthals had bigger eye sockets than we did, Fox P2 language gene. Um, and again, the negative selection for uh, sex genes uh, that uh, ours apparently worked better. Um, an alternative theory, though, is uh, about Neanderthal fitness. I hypothesize that stronger purifying selection on the X chromosome, as well as matings between Neanderthal males and human females, could account for the reduced uh, ancestry in um, the uh, X chromosome. So there are some alternative interpretations. Uh, but again, mostly uh, disease-related. Uh, lupus, uh, cirrhosis, Crohn's, type 2 diabetes, COVID-19, cystic fibrosis, cholesterol levels are all more likely if you have Neanderthal alleles. Uh, skin lesions result from sunburn, uh, keratosis. Obesity, acute upper respiratory infections, COVID. Um, uh, human uh, papillomavirus, um, increased risk for depression, decrease and increase for depression, uh, faster blood clotting. In the modern world, uh, this trait uh, means greater risk for stroke, but may have been worked if you were a hunter getting nicked. Um, lower risk of schizophrenia, response to antipsychotic drugs, 
uh, rheumatoid arthritis, genital warts, corns and calluses, uh, bladder pain, incontinence. Mm. Uh, so lots of potentially negative, okay? Um, interestingly, though, though, they found um, that uh, Neanderthal sodium channel increases pain sensitivity. Uh, so that it implies that Neanderthals were very sensitive to pain, despite our image of, you know, super halts. Um, uh, so those who carry Neanderthal variants report more pain in the, uh, the UK biobank, basically, equivalent of being eight years older in pain reporting. Uh, so uh, were they wimps? Unlikely. <laughs> okay. Um, but... Um, the COVID pandemic uh, killed 7 million people, that last number I remember. The main risk factors include old age, male sex, diabetes. Uh, but it turns out um, that SARS COVID is one of these RNA viruses that uh, Neanderthals had been um, subjected to these kinds of RNA viruses and developed some immunity. And it turns out the Neanderthal haplotype on chromosome 12 is protective against severe disease uh, if you get COVID, uh, basically, uh, on chromosome 12, okay? Um, but it turns out you get both a risk for COVID and protection from COVID depending on which you got. Again, double-edged sword. Um, in general, Neanderthal variants facilitate immune response to flus, uh, also to gas, uh, decreased risk for gastrointestinal uh, disease. Um, and uh, the major headlines about major genetic risk factor for severe COVID-19 is inherited from Neanderthals, basically. Um, the uh, uh, these uh, two uh, basically help create a cytokine storm uh, that is not uh, good uh, for your body or for uh, your lungs. Uh, and that's the risk that if you have uh, this particular um, allele, but there is an adaptive allele against COVID uh, risk. You can actually look it up if you're 23andMe to see if you have it, basically, if you download your amount, this is the one that you need to look for. Um, but basically, um, uh, the COVID variant basically hyper expresses STAT2, and this leads to severe um, uh, platelet uh, clotting mechanism in your lungs, basically. Um, so, both increased risk and protection against severe uh, COVID uh, from uh, Neanderthals. It doubles the risk of uh, carriers uh, requiring intensive care, basically. Interestingly, um, this was the bad Neanderthal gene uh, is possibly selected for only in Southeast Asia. The China next door has none of it, okay? Zero in East Asia, but 50% uh, is in India of this bad uh, gene. Why, what protection it had there originally is unknown, but in today, uh, it uh, doesn't help you at all, basically. And they think that, they estimate that this gene, this Neanderthal variant accounts for almost a million deaths of the 7 million that we've had. So Neanderthal revenge, uh, sort of. Um, uh, the chromosome 3 Neanderthal variant reduces your risk of HIV. In fact, there are two locations that reduce your uh, risk um, uh, for HIV. So again, some positive stuff. Uh, diabetes, uh, the Mayans in Mexico, Native Americans, and about 25% of Asians retain an allele that boosts their risk for type 2 diabetes. They think via 
a lipid fat transport uh, mechanism that uh, may have been good if you were starving, but is terrible if there's a lot of food available. Um, hey Charlie, so, um, yeah. practically, what is the real risk of this? I mean, diabetes has a lot of genes involved. Does it mean if you got one or two genes that you have a one in a thousand chance of getting diabetes or your family? Or is this a, a trivial effect or is this a major thing to think about? Um, none of the studies I read commented about that. So I, I can't tell you basically. Uh, although uh, it appears important in native uh, in uh, Mexican Americans in Mexico and uh, in the U.S., they they mention so they it as clinical a, diabetes if they have right. a Okay, so that's uh, somebody uh, that would be something good uh, to discover. Yeah. Uh, we mentioned the elongated skull shape that if you've got the Neanderthal variant, your skull is going to look a little more like theirs. And then there's a whole issue of chronotypes, which are related to circadian rhythms that basically the Africans going into the north of Europe basically um, uh, ended up um, uh, having, it turns out, being more of a morning person as opposed to a night person, a night owl, seems to be more Neanderthal is the conclusion. And they think it has to do with um, the amount of light uh, that's available. Uh, they also, uh, and also because of the fact of the eye orbit size and larger uh, occipital lobe uh, types in Neanderthal uh, are part of it. Interestingly, the association of Neanderthal variants with loneliness, low mood, uh, frequency of being unenthusiastic and uh, are part, uh, they think, of this chronotype phenomena that they think is related to circadian rhythms and uh, higher altitudes and the amount of light that's present. Um, but depression and addiction uh, are uh, uh, connected to the, some of the Neanderthal uh, variants. And again, uh, circadian rhythm in their the Neanderthal variants tend to be close to regions that control uh, circadian rhythms in us today. Um, and then there's effects on drug metabolism. Uh, there's reduced metabolism of warfarin, statins, ibuprofens, leading to potential toxicity if you use a therapeutic dose. Okay. Um, so it turns out uh, for... Uh, ibuprofen that rather than the two hour normal version, Neanderthal variant gives you a nine hour um, because liver does not degrade it basically. Uh, the uh, warfarin, maybe more importantly, higher dose uh, can be toxic. You need a lower dose if you have uh, this particular variant basically. Um, and they did some studies of um, uh, Neanderthal um, uh, molecules in Petri dishes showing that some of them are very good antibiotics uh, that have no negative effects, basically. So some interesting research is probably going to end up with that in the farm companies. Um, and then, again, some Africans have Neanderthal DNA uh, because there was a back movement of uh, Eurasians into Africa somewhere 2,000 to 3,000 years ago, ultimately even to the Khoisan. Um, okay, uh, I'll start and I'll have to finish next time. Uh, Denisovans, a genome in search of a skeleton and uh, an archaeology. Uh, so the complete mitochondrial DNA from a bone in Denisova, uh, we have no uh, idea of what they looked like, uh, basically, in 2010. The, the newly published uh, Tom Higgum, he's the um, Oxford uh, uh, paleontologist, uh, the world before us. This is actually uh, a fairly good read if you want a, an interesting book that kind of reviews uh, lots of this stuff. Uh, he, and he was part of uh, the research. He's an expert on... Uh, 
uh, C14 uh, uh, dating methodology, but uh, uh, I've done a lot of work with the Denisovan stuff. So it was a, a good book. And the most important message of the Denisova story is not no fossil, no matter how small, is unimportant. Even the teeniest fragment that seems completely useless, like a fragment of a finger bone, can open up a completely new world of human evolution. Its first-time genetics illuminated something that had totally escaped paleontology, basically. Um, for 20 years, uh, there were Neanderthal studies. Um, there are Except uh, for Higgins' book, there are no books, no textbook chapters on Denisovans. Between and 13 years, there were 61 peer-reviewed journal articles about Denisovans, plus dozens of science press descriptions, also large unavailable archaeological literature of the Denisovan cave in untranslated uh, journals. I've read none of those, but I have read all of these. So that's where this data comes from. Denisova cave, uh, three chambers, basically. Um, the first Denisovan genome in 2010 discovered solely by ancient DNA uh, out of a finger bone. Uh, and it turns out that the Denisovans are a sister group to the Neanderthals that separated from Neanderthals around uh, 400,000 years ago. Um, the Denisovans stayed at uh, Denisova cave off and on. Well, uh, I'll caution this, but there's data about them from 200 uh, to uh, 60K. We don't know that they actually live there because almost every bone that's in the Denisova cave, cave is regurgitated from hyenas. Okay? Uh, so we now have uh, three molars, a finger bone, which we got the whole genome from, We've got the hybrid Denny bone. We've got a mandible from 160K via protein analysis from Tibet. Uh, we have two parietal skull bones from Tibet. We have a molar from Laos. We have five recent bones from Denisova gave, uh, three uh, of which are Denisovan, uh, and I think two are Neanderthal. And then we've got DNA from the sediment in Denisova cave. And the current thinking is that there are uh, absolutely two lineages, a northern and southern version, but also a third, which may be so different that they should be a new species, okay? Um, and we do not know when Denisovans went extinct. One study concluded 15K, which would make it the longest surviving archaic species we have. Um, the Russians have been digging at Denisova for 40 years, basically. Dervanko and uh, Shunkov have been leading that thing. Um, and it's a cave that is lower than 50 degrees year round, basically. Um, and um, most of the Neanderthal DNA uh, bones that Pabo screened had about 4% DNA. The Denisovan finger had 70%. It was a massively good find, basically. Uh, we have almost no Denisovan morphological information, no complete crania, uh, no postcranial bones, no phenotypic morphological information. It's mostly DNA, basically. Um, and uh, Johannes Krauss, uh, was the guy that analyzed the, the bone, the finger bone. And this was it, a little pinky, uh, two grains of rice size that they basically destroyed in the process of getting the DNA. Uh, this is what it looked like. We know from the DNA that, um, that basically uh, the little part was given to Pabo, the long part was given to Ed Rubin at UC Berkeley, and that has disappeared. Nobody knows where it is, okay? Um, but 13-year-old girl from the right hand 
uh, final uh, phalanx of the little finger pinky bone dated to 50 to 70 K had dark brown hair, brown eyes and dark skin. And this is the two pieces of that bone basically. Uh, this is the one that we got the genome uh, from. Um, and uh, one woman that got it from Ruben ended up doing very good photography. So at least we know what it actually looked like. Uh, that's the pinky originally called the X woman. That's Pavo's uh, hand holding uh, the piece of pinky bone. We also have uh, multiple massive uh, molars, the largest molars in any uh, Neanderthal, Denisovan, modern human uh, type. Um, there's a huge controversy. Um, the uh, Life of Pabo group refused to give it a Latin name. So they only talk about Denisovans, whereas the Russians want one of these names, basically, uh, but they haven't won out yet. Um, it's actually unknown whether the Denisovans actually lived in the Denisovan cave. Uh, they didn't bury their dead there. The bone fragments found inside were regurgitated by predators. Uh, there's acid uh, data uh, to prove that. They were there from 300 to 50K. Uh, evidence shows that they were genetically um, less diverse like the Neanderthals, but not quite as much. Um, and we have lots of DNA Denisovan in the uh, uh, Indonesian uh, subgroups, basically, as well as Native Peruvians. Americans, Peruvians. And interestingly, the one place in Europe that they found it is in Icelanders. They don't know why. It was a very small population, pretty inbred. Um, and everyone has some Denisovan ancestry. Uh, uh, also has Neanderthal. They go hand in hand, basically. We have lots of immune genes that are uh, Denisovan as well. And so the current statistics is Australian Aborigines have 5%. Uh, New Guineans have 5%. Melanesian, New Caledonia Island, Eastern Indonesia, Polynesia, mainland Asia, and Native Americans have 0.2%. Denisovan. Uh, archaic group, uh, different dental features we know, and we don't know about their facial features. Uh, uh, let's see, we've talked about that and that. Uh, fraction of uh, Neanderthal, 2% around the world, okay? Whereas uh, for the Denisovan fraction of the 5%, uh, the most is here, little bit, very little. Uh, I haven't seen anything that says Africa or Europeans except for Iceland have it. Uh, again, Indonesian. And they think um, Heidelbergensis went this way, Neanderthals went this way and this way. Both show up at Denisova Cave, but the Denisovans basically um, uh, were in this region. Uh, and again, this area doesn't have much. So Neanderthal, uh, Denisovan. Um, hmm. And question? <laughs> okay. Uh, I have, uh, can, I, can I ask a question from way back in your talk? Uh, yeah. Quickly, the thing about Sahelanthropus, uh, the notion about having the spinal cord in the middle of the skull, uh, how do you, is that still believed that that was one check mark in favor of them being upright walkers as a, or, 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 or is that not proven either? Well, the data, um, I really liked the last study. I mean, it, it seemed yeah. very thorough. Um, and again, even they uh, said there are potentially uh, alternative explanations, but uh, their conclusion is that they were knuckle walkers. Um, so, uh, but isn't there I'm a body of evidence that says that the, that the skulls of the Sahelanthropus had, you know, the hole was in the middle of the head, and and that fits the whole idea of uh, upright heads? 
Right. That that was one of the early reasons for calling it uh, bipedal. In fact, it was one of the only uh, pieces of evidence that indicated that they were uh, bipedal. Uh, so uh, this only one skull. Right. There is only one skull. Only one yeah. skull. There, there are no, uh, this is a solitary fossil, basically, and the skull, which is highly uh, fractionated. Um, uh, and so much of it has sort of had to be relooked, computerized, et cetera. So it's all postulated, basically. When I look at the and model we have, right. Harold. But I also think that the, uh, the guy who has, who actually has the fragment is not letting other scientists look at, at it. Right. That's He's been one of the problems. That's mm -hmm. been one of the problems. So and the current um, study has the, not only the bone curvature, but it has some genetic studies too, or what is the- No, no uh, genetics, no. So it's basically the bones- Basically the, the curvature studies, of the bone. Is there other studies or do they have a lot of, ex a lot of samples in this current study? The current study has about a hundred different comparison okay. uh, um, uh, things that they did with modern, archaic, et cetera. So, um, so now uh, who is the first bipedal? At this point, I'm going to say Artie. <laughs> Artie? Yeah. Um, yeah, um, yeah. In comparison. So until we get another study uh, that comes to a different conclusion, um, that's my current hypothesis. So, okay. All right. Lily, can I ask a different question? Yeah. Uh, uh, Homo heidelbergensis. I, I thought the heidelbergensis, they were, it was only, we only know them to be ancestors to the Neanderthals and Denisovans, and we don't think they are ancestor to uh, Homo sapiens. Is that correct or not? That That's the current contention of a number uh, of very good paleontologists, Chris Stringer, uh, a bunch of that group now has concluded that um, Heidelbergensis develops into uh, Neanderthal in Europe, but no longer because of this multi-regional right. hypothesis that that's true in um, uh, Africa. Originally, they thought... Um, the classic Heidelbergensis in Africa was the Broken Hill Skull. We have it in the closet and upstairs. Um, but that got redated to be 300K. Yeah. And with that dating, it suddenly made the Jebel or Hood uh, modern human one exactly identical in date. So this one can't be the ancestor is the current thinking in Africa. Um, but also the Bodo skull uh, is considered Heidelbergensis at 600K in Africa, but nobody's talking about that so much uh, from the current research. So we will see. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So I'll finish up uh, next time, next, uh, whenever the, let's see, um, one of those dates. In May, it'll be the 22nd. We will continue on. Okay. Thanks again for being here, and we'll see you.